Now I introduce uh, Dr. Filippo Baldi that will talk about blastocyst endometrium cross talk. Good morning, everybody, and uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like. Should I try? Okay. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, the presidents, um, uh, Professor Seracchioli and Enrico and uh, Valentino, for the very kind invitation to this uh, very interesting meeting and very well attended meeting. And, um, and uh, also for the lecture that they gave to me, which is indeed a challenging lecture, Blastocyst and Ometrum Cross Talk. So, one of the most important, frustrating issues that who works in the reproductive field every day has to face with the patients is uh, the failure of the embryo implantation. So the failure of the embryo implantation uh, is uh, indeed something that sometimes, very often, we cannot explain to the patients. And the patients do not understand why it fails to implant. We know it's from uh, many years that uh, one uh, uh, of uh, the method to try to select the embryo with the highest implantation potential, the cleaving, the cleaving embryo, is the morphological, to look at the morphological uh, quality of the cleaving embryo. Then we can improve the chance of this embryo to uh, give a live birth if we let culture in um, to, until the blastocyst, uh, the blastocyst uh, stage. And then, uh, the, to the blastocyst stage, and then we can select also uh, the morphological quality of the blastocyst. But we can uh, further increase the implantation rate, uh, assessing the chromosomal status of uh, the blastocyst with the, chromos the comprehensive chromosomal uh, screening, the PGT4 aneuploidies. But still, 50% about, in our hands, the implantation rate of uh, a single euploid blastocyst is 50%. Uh, so 50% of the euploid blastocysts that we transfer still fail to implant. And this implantation failure, this is very, very difficult to explain. So shall we try to look at the other parameters that could further increase uh, the uh, predictive uh, possibilities of the blastocyst to give a live birth? And when we think to other parameters that we can look at, then we have two uh, the most important players. And the two most important players are, of course, the blastocyst, the embryo, and the uterus in the other side. Uh, during the last 20 years, the most studied, for sure, was the embryo, and less studied was the, was the um, endometrium. So with regard to if we start first, uh, to the embryo, what else can we investigate to the embryo? Then, I have some problem with, yeah. Then, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what, we could, what we could see is that uh, the morphological uh, um, characteristics of the embryo that the vast majority of the centers in the world use to select the embryo with the highest implantation potential, indeed is not strictly correlated with the chromosomal status of the blastocyst. This is a, a paper that we published in uh, 2014 on the analysis, com comprehensive chromosomal screening analysis of uh, almost 1,000 uh, blastocysts. And then we observed, and then we observed Okay. And then we observe then that when the blastocyst is considered excellent according to its morphological quality, then the chance that this blastocyst is euploid is about 56%. Uh, this is the mean age of the patients was in this group of patients was 39. When the blastocyst is extremely poor quality, that most of the IVF centers discard this blastocyst, then still there's a 25% of the blastocysts that are euploid. So it means that still one blastocyst out of four can give a live birth. And also when we look at the velocity uh, where the embryo reaches the blastocyst stage, if the, if the blastocyst reaches the blastocyst stage at day five or day seven, then the chromosomal uh, quality of the blastocyst is not uh, different. 
Moreover, when we normalize, moreover, when we normalize the, uh, the um, blastocyst according to the chromosomal status, so when we transfer the applied blastocyst, then the ongoing implantation rate would be around 50%. Either is the blastocyst was excellent and morphologic appearance, or good, or extremely poor. Another method that is uh, normally used is the time-lapse parameters of the embryo evaluation in order to try to select with a time-lapse morphology if the embryo has higher chance to implant or not. <clears throat> in 2014, we did um, a study comparing the chromosomal comprehensive with chromo chromosomal comprehensive uh, analysis, the chromosomal status of the blastocyst with the time-lapse parameters. And time-lapse parameters that were used uh, uh, by the Campbell's parameters blastocyst formation or the uh, time-lapse parameters that we used by, um, uh, by uh, Basile in 2014, and we could not find any correlation. I did not put here because I did not have time to put, but in the last issue of uh, human reproduction, there's another paper that's uh, confirming that there's no correlation between the chromosomal status of the, of the blastocyst with the time-lapse uh, uh, um, parameters uh, that, we can, uh, that we can use. So, in the last 10 years, other additional non-invasive or minimal invasive embryonic evaluation have been uh, tried to use, and uh, in particular, the uh, cumulus cell gene expression was one uh, uh, topic that has been worked a lot. But unfortunately, there are no conclusive results to find new, new novel biomarkers of all site competence and embryo implantation has been found and never proven to be uh, clinically effective. But let me say that in the future, or in the very near future, uh, some uh, hopes uh, will, uh, will come to uh, further analysis on the trophoectoderm biopsies and uh, uh, analysis that will uh, give inform information on epigenomic, transcriptomics, mirnomics studies that are actually ongoing to try to identify novel biomarkers uh, to try to uh, select the embryo with the highest implantation potential and try to uh, um, uh, be responsible of uh, managing the uh, dialogue between embryo and blastocyst implantation. So what else can we investigate? Let's see the, on the endometrium uh, counterpart. So we know that uh, the endometrium has to be prepared with the estradiol during the follicular phase, then it has to be uh, prepared with the uh, progesterone during the luteal phase, and that it, it has a, a specific, very limited uh, period where the, it allows the embryo to implant, which has been defini defined as a window of implantation. And Professor Pellisser uh, gave uh, extensive uh, um, information, fantastic information on uh, the window of the implantation. And during this window of the implantation, there's um, the endometrial cells um, express specific genes that facilitate or sometimes uh, limit the blastocyst capacity to invade the uterine surface. Unfortunately, this gene expression profile is not identical in all women, is not universal. And some women have specific characteristics of these, uh, of these uh, um, um, specific gene profiles. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, what uh, Professor Pellisset talked in his lecture, uh, the ERA test, which is um, a test that takes into account the expression of 238 genes that are, uh, that are expressed by the endometrial cells during the implantation window. And he demonstrated how uh, these can give uh, can uh, locate exactly the window of implantation uh, in each single woman, and this is especially important in women with repeated implantation failure, because I can have a patient that has the, implantation, the window of implantation that could be anticipated or posticipated according to the traditional window of implantation that is conventional um, uh, considered to be seven days after the LH peak. Uh, very recently, this is, um, this is a publication on December in 2015, January 2016, um, Nick Macklin and his group 
uh, identified a signature containing 303 genes that is able, apparently is able to um, uh, is predict the uh, repeated implantation, the repeated implantation failure. This gene signature could be of very interest in a clinical practice because when we have a, uh, this uh, gene signature, we can make a specific counseling for the patient and we can try to uh, look at uh, different strategies of management of their, of their um, um, treatments. But unfortunately, so far, this is not uh, clinically uh, tested. It's not clinically available, this uh, kind of signature. A very important question, and this is a very important question because it's a problem that we face every day with our patients. A very important question to answer is, uh, is implantation could be boosted by an inflammatory-like response? So we know that uh, uh, a pivotal role is played by the immune system at the implantation side. So in this paper by Jill Moore, published a few years ago in 2011, we can see that macrophage and monocyte platelets on the top of matrigel migrate towards trophoblast cells on the bottom, while they do not migrate in the absence of uh, the trophoblast cells. So this evidence suggested that it could be possible that the successful implantation could be secondary to a development of an injury-like inflammatory reaction. And on the basis of this suggestion, it's about 10 years that it became very popular, the endometrial scratching. It is so popular amongst the doctors that uh, uh, work in the reproductive field that it is all, almost automatically performed. But even worse is the patients that comes to you during the consultation and ask you, doctor, why don't you scratch my endometrium? Because if you go to internet, you can see that in all website, in all in all forums, you can see that, uh, that uh, uh, the endometrial scratching improves the embryo implantation. But is this true? And indeed, it is not true, because if we look at the randomized control trials published so far, there's no significant difference whether you scratch or whether you don't scratch. And uh, there are only this, this misleading information is uh, given by uh, meta-analysis. And you know that meta-analysis very often gives uh, misleading information because are not well done. They put inside apples with peer, and then they cannot compare exactly in the, uh, the results. Moreover, there are some uh, risk of the uh, endometrial scratching, and the risk is that it's caustic and gives uh, uh, injuries on the endometrium and uh, other things. So it is suggested uh, 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 with the evidence of 1A that endometrial biopsy has no sense uh, to enhance implantation potential. But what about if we, instead of investigating the embryo or investigating the, uh, the uterus, the endometrium, why don't we investigate the dialogue between uh, the, in, the blastocyst and the endometrium? Several factors have been uh, very well known to have uh, an important role in these dialogues. Most of these factors are uh, epidermal growth factors, AGF, transforming growth factor, IGF-1, IGF-2, or they are or they are uh, leaf interleukin um, and prostaglandin, COX. But there are still many other uh, factors and pathways that are still not completely known. This is a very, this is a very important information that Hoodsy gave to us a few years ago, that the transcriptomic profiles coming from gene expression analysis are different in the blastocyst from uh, the transcriptomic profiles that we can obtain from the endometrial cells. 
they made a uh, very elegant experiment. They took uh, uh, 18 women undergoing controlled ovarian hyper stimulation. They took an uh, endometrial biopsy. They I isolated the endometrial cells, and they analyzed, and they make the gene expression analysis with uh, uh, array, with microarrays. The results were confirmed with qPCR. They did the same in uh, blastocysts that were donated for research. They took uh, the trophoectoderm cells, and then they made gene expression analysis. And then the results were confirmed by um, qPCR. What they observed, that many genes were uh, significantly overexpressed, but most of these genes were different from those that were expressed by the trophoectoderm cells and those from uh, the endometrium. So there were different gene expression of growth factors and the growth factor receptors in the trophoectoderm and the endometrial and the endometrial cells. In fact, in fact, we can see here from this slide that, uh, uh, for instance, the KDR, the KDR is a receptor for a placenta growth factor. And then you can see that the expression of KDR is highly expressed in endometrium, but is not expressed at all in the trophectoderma. And if we look at the placenta growth factor, the placenta growth factor is highly expressed in the trophectoderm, but is not expressed in the endometrium. Similarly, the PDGF receptor that is expressed in the endometrium, but is not expressed on the endometrium, on the, the um, Sorry, but is not expressed in the trophectoderm. So the differentially expressed genes, and most of these genes are related to the implantation process, encode protein that uh, mainly are adhesion molecules, receptors, and are molecules that are involved in the uh, communication and attachment. So the endometrium express uh, some molecules, and the trophoblasts express some other molecules, but that together work, can work together to uh, enhance the implantation uh, process. So at the beginning of the endometrial preparation, uh, the, magic, the, the, the most important players are the uh, uh, hormones. The estradiol uh, during the follicular phase uh, stimulates the uh, mm, proliferation of the endometrium. Then in the luteal phase, the progesterone, the progesterone uh, induces the transformation and uh, uh, wide opens the window of, of implantation. But when the blastocyst reaches the endometrial cavity, then it starts the process, that it starts the dialogue between the blastocyst and the endometrium. And this dialogue is similar to the cellular inflammation inflammatory response, but there are not only but there are not only cytokines, but there are not only the cytokines that are involved as messengers for this dialogue. There must be some other messages. There must be something else besides the cytokines that uh, can be uh, uh, used during this uh, uh, dialogue. So the human blastocyst, uh, we know that the human blastocyst release soluble factors that regulate endometrial gene expression and adhesive properties that are required for endometrium receptivity implantation and pregnancy. And this was, uh, was uh, uh, clearly demonstrated it was clearly demonstrated by Kuban in 2013, where they found that some factors in spent blastocyst culture media can influence the endometrial receptivity. What they observed that the additions of the trophoblast-like cells to human epithelial endometrial cells increases if they are exposed to culture media from implanted blastocysts. So at the end, they suggested that there must be something in the spent blastocyst culture media that can boost the implantation process. What is this something? Another interesting experiment, another interesting uh, information comes from this uh, pay, uh, work by Weimar in 2012. And they found, they reported that endometrial cells from recurrent miscarriage patients are super receptive. So they, they stratify endometrial cells from, uh, from uh, uh, patients with uh, recurrent miscarriage, and then they put over these endometrial cells uh, different quality, morphological quality embryos, good quality embryo, 
low quality embryos and even degenerated embryos. So they observed with a migration AC that the cell migrate towards any embryo that was laid on the dish, probably due to a selection problem, probably due to uh, um, uh, an issue that uh, uh, this uh, selection uh, method is, fa is failing. And so they defined this condition like a super receptive phenotype. This, this uh, uh, condition was not observed in normal fertile, fer normal fertile patients. And you can see in the first three uh, figures that if you repeat exactly the same experiment, then you can see that um, at the migration I see, the, this, the, only, the, 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 the endometrial cells migrate towards only the high quality embryo. They do not migrate uh, through low quality embryos. They repeated the same experiment that is not published here, that I did not put uh, the, uh, the, 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 the paper in these slides. They repeated the same experiments, but instead of lying the embryos with different morphological quality, they put uh, spent culture media from implanted and non-implanted blastocysts. And then they observed exactly the same results. So in the, in, also in the spent culture media, there must be, so there must be something. What is this something that can boost or can modulate or can inhibit uh, the implantation of, of uh, uh, the embryos? All the investigated non-invasive approaches during the last 10 years in spent culture media in order to try to identify the embryo with the highest implantation potential uh, failed so far to have a clinical relevance. There is no non-invasive platform that has proven to improve clinical predictive value in prospective randomized control trial compared with current morphologic-based selection methods. So in other words, all the omics approaches that have been proposed uh, apparently have no clinical benefit when we apply to clinical IDF. Maybe then we should look at the exosome. The exosome has putative carriers of messengers molecule. The exosomes are the lipid envelope that contain protein, RNA messengers, DNAs, lipids, and microRNAs. And microRNAs have never been investigated before as putative mediators of blastocyst endometrial crosstalk. So, exosome have been demonstrated to be present in the spent culture media of uh, the blastocyst in vitro. In this uh, paper uh, by this group of uh, Nge, uh, recently published, they demonstrated uh, using the uterine fluid the presence of, these of, um, of uh, exosomes. And the vast majority of the exosomes are exactly the same of the exosomes that are produced by the endometrial cells, then suggesting the, that the endometrial cells release exosomes containing microRNAs in the extracellular environment. Interestingly, the blastocyst can uptake the exosome and internalize the microRNAs that they carry. So you can see here in the figure uh, uh, the, the blastocyst without exosome that are internalized and the blastocyst plus labeled exosomes. You, you can see the green spots that are the labeled exosomes that have been internalized in the blastocyst. So we can consider the microRNAs an interesting putative messenger in this blastocyst endometrial close talk. Why there are interesting uh, putative messengers? Because the ideal non-invasive embryonic biomarker should be, should be stable and resistant over time, should be specific to the embryos, and should be easily detectable. In a cell-free, microRNAs uh, are resistant to RNA's digestion, freezing and thawing, extreme pH treatment, and DA's treatment. So they, are, they must be also specific to embryos and easily detectable. So the detection of small changes in secreted protein, like the omics that were, uh, have been extensively studied uh, and metabolized, is complicated by the fact 
that uh, the background signal from the high concentrations of protein and metabolites that are present in the culture media. And this is not true for the microRNAs. In fact, if we look at these molecules, then these molecules go together with many other molecules that are present in the culture media. But if we look at the, if you look at the, at the uh, microRNAs, the microRNAs are not present in the culture media. So the microRNAs that we observe in the culture media are the microRNAs that are released by the blastocyst. Then finally, uh, an ideal non-invasive embryonic biomarker should be pleiotropic. And it is estimated that each single microRNA can regulate up to 50% of human genes translation and biological pathways. In 2015, Kuhlman, for the first time, identified the important role that is played by the microRNAs in the endometrium blastocyst crosstalk. In his study, they uh, studied the microenome analysis of spent blastocyst culture media from implanted versus non-implanted embryos. And what they find that in, they were able to identify one microRNA, the MIR661, that was significantly higher expressed in the culture media of, of non-implanted blastocysts. So they observed that this microRNA in culture media decreases the expression of its targets in the media cells. And when they add the culture media with these microRNAs, with the 661, in, uh, to the tropho-ectoderm-like cells, they uh, attach less well to the endometrial cells in vitro. But if they, they use the culture media with this microRNA together with its inhibitor, and they repeat exactly the same experiment, the trophoectoderm-like cells then will implant, will attach with the same extent of uh, the controls. We, in the last three, four years, we are extensively studying the potential role of microRNAs in blastocyst implantation and the potential role of blastocysts as a mediator of blastocyst endometrium dialogue and implantation. And in 2013, we were awarded of a research grant by the HFA um, because we are uh, with a research project that uh, is uh, trying to assess whether the mi some microRNAs can be uh, used as a biomarker to predict the implantation of a blastocyst. We published this paper last year in Fertile Sterile, uh, where we, first of all, um, uh, we uh, demonstrated that microRNAs in spent blastocyst culture media can be profiled with high reproducibility. So we took the spent culture media from uh, uh, the uh, cultured blastocyst, uh, and then with, with QPCR analysis, we analyzed uh, the microRNAs that were present inside. Then we did the same thing for the blastocysts that were cultured in uh, dead culture media, and we, we took the uh, trophectoderm cells, and then we analyzed the microRNAs coming from the to those trophectoderm cells. And then we observed that the vast majority of uh, uh, the microRNAs that were observed in culture media uh, were present also in the blastocyst, in the trophectoderm cells. Then we wanted to assess whether, from when, these uh, microRNAs comes from uh, the embryos, the developing embryos. Comes from the cleaving embryo, comes from the modula, or comes from the blastocyst. The vast majority of these microRNAs comes from the blastocyst. And, um, sorry, and uh, few the few microRNAs that we could find at the cleavage or the modular stage then are shared also uh, from those that are observed in the spent blastocyst culture media. And then finally, and this is more interesting from a clinical viewpoint, we took uh, um, uh, 44 donors, 506 cumulus cell complex retrieved, we injected uh, 348 matured oocyte, then the fertilization, we, fertilized, we obtained 266 fertilized oocyte, and uh, we obtained 154 blastocysts. These blastocysts were, uh, were biopsied. The trophoectoderm biopsy was vitrified and was analyzed, and the spent culture media was saved and frozen. 
Then we put with co PCR and applied the screening, and we found 52% that were employed. Uh, then uh, uh, we transferred 53 blastocysts and 28 non implanted and 25 implanted. Then we wanted to see uh, from the compare if in the spent culture media of implanted blastocysts were some microRNAs that uh, uh, are more expressed, uh, significantly more expressed than microRNAs from, um, from culture media of non implanted blastocysts. And then what we observed, that two microRNAs, the MIR-20A and the MIR-30C, was significantly higher expressed in the spent culture media uh, uh, from implanted blastocysts. So this is the last piece of work that actually we are doing, and uh, this research project has been uh, once again uh, awarded with a, a research award of, from GFA in 2015, and it is a multi-center, non-selection, blind study to define the positive predictive value and non-predictive and uh, negative predictive value of spent blastocyst uh, cultural media analysis on the custom plate. And you can see that we are actually receiving uh, spent cultural media from different centers um, in New Jersey, uh, Gothenburg, King's College in London, Brussels, and ourselves. So this is my last question, and I would like to thank all uh, uh, the colleagues uh, uh, that work in, uh, and they did, sorry, Okay, uh, all the colleagues, especially uh, the, um, the colleagues that work in the uh, genetic uh, team that did uh, a grand part of this work. Okay, thank you for your attention.